بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. إن شاء الله continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. أسيرة النبوية, the prophetic biography. We've been discussing and talking about the conquest of Mecca, and so إن شاء الله we'll be continuing with that today. The conquest of Mecca, فتح مكة, the opening of the city of Mecca, is of course not, you know. not just simply one of the most monumental events of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and a realization of the dream of the Prophet ﷺ, a fulfillment of the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet ﷺ and the believers within the Qur'an. But along with that, it's also a very powerful, very rich moment uh, that is filled with just so many remarkable um, Things, so many different remarkable gems, and and uh, so many things that we can take guidance and advice, and we can find direction and instruction within. So, I wanted to go ahead and continue on with some of these conversations, interactions that the Prophet Sallallahu was having. One of the very beautiful events. Now, I want to kind of, I, I would like to frame this. As uh, before I mention this and before we talk more about this, I want to frame this properly. Just so everyone has a full understanding and appreciation of exactly what it meant. The Prophet ﷺ was born and raised in Mecca. His family, they are Quraysh, they are Meccans, they are Banu Hashim, they are the caretakers of the Kaaba, they are the people who serve water to the visitors of the Kaaba, to the Hujjaj. So the Prophet ﷺ, his history and his heritage is so intimately and closely tied to the Kaaba, to the city of Mecca. There's no doubt about that. When the Prophet ﷺ receives divine revelation, his mission begins in Mecca. The Qur'an, the beginning of the Qur'an, like the first portion of the Qur'an is revealed in Mecca. And the Prophet ﷺ spends 13 years preaching and teaching in Mecca. Of course we know that those 13 years were extremely difficult, very tumultuous, very trying and testing and challenging. The Prophet ﷺ very reluctantly and also optimistically, but at the same time there was some element of sadness. in departing from Mecca, leaving the Kaaba, the Prophet ﷺ leaves under these very challenging circumstances. But, so while you can imagine and you can understand the pain, the anguish, the sadness of the Prophet ﷺ in departing from Mecca, there's also a great amount of optimism and hope and, and um, encouragement and, and just potential for what he finds in the city of Medina. Because he finds a city, a place that is ripe for this mission and the establishment of this cause and the furthering of this cause. He finds a people who are so dedicated, loyal. They're very humble, modest people in number and in resources. But their dedication, their loyalty, their commitment, their courage, their valor, their bravery, their honesty, their integrity is just remarkable. And they fall in love with the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ comes to love them very dearly. I've mentioned this before, I've talked about this before. The Prophet ﷺ said, Wallahi, la antum ashaddu nasi hubban ilayya. I, he said, one time he said to the Ansar, I swear to God, you are some of the most beloved people to me. I swear by Allah, you are some of the most beloved people to me. The Prophet ﷺ was sitting one time in Medina with his back to the, the masjid, and there was a group of the women and the children of the Ansar returning back from like a wedding gathering, a celebration. And the Prophet ﷺ sat up, in one narration he stood up, and he said that I swear to Allah, you are some of the most beloved people to me. And then he made dua, he raised his hands and he said, Allahumma ghfir al-ansar, wa li abna'i al-ansar, wa li awladi al-ansar, wa li awladi awladi al-ansar. That, oh Allah, forgive the ansar and forgive the children of the ansar and the grandchildren of the ansar. And he just had so much love for them. And so, there's this very interesting dynamic, where of course the Prophet ﷺ was tied to Mecca, and he had this undeniable, Uh, love for the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Kaaba, the Baytullah. But at the same time, he had, there have been so many blessings in Medina. 
And the Prophet ﷺ referred to Medina as Tayyiba, as this beautiful place. So there's this very interesting dynamic now, but what you can imagine on the part of the Ansar, who have accompanied the Prophet ﷺ on this journey for Fatih Makkah, as they're standing there, as they're witnessing all of this, that Makkah has opened up, the idols have been you know, thrown out of the Kaaba, the Adhan has been called, the prayer is going on, the Tawaf is being done, Makkah has entered into the fold of Islam. That now the, 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 the dream of Makkah coming into Islam has been realized. And it's very logical, it's very understandable for someone to think at that moment, is he gonna come back home or not? Is he gonna come back to Medina? Does he need to come back to Medina? Does he need us any longer? And so the narration mentions that when the Prophet was standing on Safa, the mountain of Safa, where we start the Sa'i from, I talked about this, he went to the place of Safa, and he stood there and he looked at the Kaaba and he was just overcome, overwhelmed by this gratitude and humility before Allah. And this is gratitude for this blessing and this gift. And he raised his hands and he was making dua and praising Allah. That the narration mentions, وَقَدْ أَحْدَقَتْ بِهِ الْأَنصَارِ And the Ansar were around him. فَقَالُوا فِي مَا بَيْنَهُمْ Some of the Ansar kind of were whispering to one another. They said to each other, أَتَرَوْنَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ إِذْ فَتَحَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ أَرْضَهُ وَبَلَدَهُ يُقِيمُ بِهَا that now that God has basically brought His home, His city, His people into Islam, that He will just stay here? Do you think that's, that's a possibility? And the Prophet ﷺ was standing there making his dua. When he got done, the Prophet ﷺ said, Mada qultum? What are y'all talking about? And they said, La shay, ya Rasulullah, la shay. Nothing, nothing, we're not talking about anything. But the Prophet ﷺ saw the look on their faces, that there was just this concern, this worry. You know, when, you, when, you, when, you're, deal, when you're nervous about something, you're anxious about something. You know, little dunyawi things, little worldly affairs, you have a job interview coming up. You're, you put in a bid on a house. You know, so many different little things like that that happen in worldly affairs. You know, and, and some things that are more important actually, like maybe you have a family member going through a surgical procedure. Or you went to go give, you know, a blood test and you're not sure about the results. So many different things like this that happen in this world, the effects of which are relegated to this world. And you can read it on someone's face. You can see it on someone's face. So they could see it. This is something so much more profound. This is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa فَلَمْ يَزَلْ بِهِمْ The Prophet ﷺ kept asking them, What is it? What is it? What are y'all not telling me? What's going on here? I can read your faces. Something's up. حَتَّى أَخْبَرُهُ Until they finally fessed up and they said, Ya Rasulullah, we don't mean any disrespect by this. But it's, it's just a question. That this is the dream. And this has happened now. Are you going to be staying here? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ma'adh Allah. Look how it's so powerful. And the Prophet ﷺ is so empathetic. And the Prophet ﷺ is so gracious and so kind and so generous. He understands that they're very distraught by this. He says, Ma'adh Allah, God forbid. God forbid. It's nothing wrong with living in Mecca. But just to console them, to let them know that any type of an answer saying like, oh no, 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 don't worry about it, inshallah, inshallah. You know how like we respond to people? Right? Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Make dua. Right? Whatever is for the best. Which is all code for yes, basically yes. Right? But the Prophet needed to console them, comfort them. And he says, Ma'adh Allah, God forbid. Al mahya mahyakum. وَالْمَمَاتُ مَمَاتُكُمْ SubhanAllah So beautiful, so powerful. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said, I will live with you and I will die with you. I live with you and I die. I live amongst you, I die amongst you. And that's that graciousness of the Prophet ﷺ. That's the loyalty of the Prophet ﷺ. That's the generosity of the spirit of the Prophet 
that you put everything in with me. You invested everything into me and my mission and this cause. And I'm with you on that. Just because another, the opportunity, the situation has changed, doesn't change the fact I'm with you all. Moving forward, there's a very beautiful story that's mentioned by Ibn Hisham, that while they were there in Mecca, and they stayed in Mecca for the remainder of the month of Ramadan, that while they were there for the, for the remaining days, there's a very powerful particular story. The Prophet ﷺ was doing tawaf one day. And there was a young man in Mecca by the name of Fudala ibn Umair al-Layfi. Fudala ibn Umair al-Layfi. Young man. He had not accepted Islam yet. And there were some people, quietly, privately, they had not accepted Islam and they were still very distraught and very upset. They were very angry about how things had turned out. They were not content with the situation. Even though the Prophet ﷺ had forgiven them, the Prophet ﷺ had granted them total safety and protection. The Prophet ﷺ had in fact been generous and kind with them. But you know, some, some people, they either take time to come around and some people tragically are just stubborn. So there were some people, some of the older heads who were stuck. But they were keeping it private. Fudala was his young man, and he had not accepted Islam yet either. He went to some of these old men, some of these leaders, and he basically said that, would you like me to take care of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And they said, anta laha ya Fudala, go for it. If you can do it, then go for it. Fudala says that, in one narration he mentions that, you know, I was very good in wielding a dagger, like a knife, a small knife. Like having a small knife very inconspicuously on you, and then being able to just shank someone, stab someone, close proximity very quickly. Like I was good with that. And so he says that I took the knife, I took the dagger, and I went into the haram, the Kaaba, the masjid. And the Prophet ﷺ was doing tawaf. يَطُوفُ بِالْبَيْتِ The Prophet ﷺ was doing tawaf. And if this is the Kaaba, the Prophet ﷺ was doing the tawaf closest to the Kaaba, and there were some people around him. There was a crowd of sahaba doing tawaf. And the Prophet ﷺ was on the inner part of the circle, close to the Kaaba. And he was doing tawaf. So Fudala says that he went in and he joined in, but he didn't rush up to the Prophet ﷺ. That would have been strange, or somebody would have gotten like kind of nervous about that. So he says he joined into the tawaf and very casually kind of inched his way inside, inside the circle. Until he says, فَلَمَّا دَنَا مِنْهُ Until he got close to the Prophet ﷺ and he was next to the Prophet ﷺ. And he says, I was thinking to myself, okay, how am I going to do, how am I going to do this? What exactly am I going to do? What's the plan? What's the strategy here? And he says, as I was thinking this to myself, the Prophet ﷺ turned to him and he said, Afudana? He just randomly, without warning, he just turned to me and he said, Afudana? Wait, wait, aren't you Fudana? And he says, it kind of took me by surprise. I said, Na'am Fudala ya Rasulullah. I said, yes, Fudala, O Messenger of God. Had to keep up the act. So then he says, the Prophet ﷺ looked at me, and the Prophet ﷺ said, مَاذَا كُنْتَ تُحَدِّثْ بِهِ نَفْسَكْ What were you thinking right now? What were you thinking about doing? And he says, now I got really nervous. I was a cool character, a cool cat. But now the way that he just asked me that, it rattled me. And I said, لا, 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 لا شيء, لا شيء. كنت أذكر الله. Oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. I was not nothing, I was thinking nothing. I'm just here worshiping God like everybody else, worshiping God. Azkurullah. فَضَّحِكَ النَّبِي صَلَّى The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiled, he laughed. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that he placed his hand on my chest. He placed his hand on my chest. And he said, Istaghfirullah. Ask Allah for forgiveness. Ask Allah for forgiveness. And Fudala says, Wallahi, I swear to God, ما رفع يده عن صدري حتى ما من خلق الله شيء أحب أحب إلي منه. By the time he lifted his hand off of my chest, there was nothing that I loved more than the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. His gentleness. His kindness, His graciousness, 
his love, that, that, that putting the hand on the chest is like a gesture of love to somebody younger. Fudala was a young man. It's like putting your arm, in our culture, like putting your arm around someone's shoulder. Shows love. It's obvious he knows why I'm there. And he shows me love. فَسَكَنَ قَلْبَهُ He brought so much peace to my heart. And he says, by the time he lifted his hand off my chest, there was nothing I loved more than the Prophet ﷺ. And at that moment I believed. أَشَدُوا لَا إِلَهَ وَأَشَدُوا أَنَّكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ He says after some time, this internalizing what had just happened, he even talks about how powerful this moment was for him. He shares something very personal. He says, فَرَجَعْتُ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِي I started to go back home. فَمَرَرْتُ بِإِمْرَأَةٍ كُنْتُ أَتَحَدَّثُ إِلَيْهَا He kind of uses some, you know, a euphemism, where basically he says, I passed by a home where there lived a woman that I had relations with. Illicit relations with. An inappropriate relationship with. But the way he says it is, there were, I passed by the house of a woman, and we used to have you know, some dealings, some interactions, some conversations. And he says that as I was passing by, she saw me passing by, and she said, Halumma ilay, halumma ilal hadith. Why don't you come on in? We'll hang out. Why don't you come on in? We'll hang out. And he says, I said to her at that moment, I was still dealing with this moment. And I said, La. No, 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 no. And he says that I walked away saying the following words. Poetry. He says, Halumma qalat halumma ilal hadithi faqultu la. Ya'ba alayki allahu wal islamu. أَوْ مَا رَأَيْتِ مُحَمَّدًا وَقَبِيلَهُ بِالْفَتْحِ يَوْمًا تُكَسَّرُ الْأَسْنَامُ لَرَأَيْتِ دِينَ اللَّهِ أَضْحَى بَيِّنًا وَالشِّرْكَ يَغْشَى وَجْهَهُ الْإِذْلَامُ He says the following words, he says that she asks me to come in and hang out with her. But I said no. That God and Islam no longer allow me to come and be with you. He says that, have you not seen Muhammad and his people have come? and opened up the city of Mecca, and destroyed and torn down the idols. You, if you look outside, you will see that the deen of Allah, the religion of God is, has arrived, and it is clear as day. And the idolatry, and the sinful way we used to live our lives, those days are long gone. They are nowhere to be found. And he said that one moment with the Prophet ﷺ, it changed my life. And, and while yes, you know, we could chalk this up to this being a miracle of the Prophet ﷺ. A miracle, prophetic miracle, absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. But we'd be doing ourselves a, dis, ourselves a disservice if we just stopped right there. Pay attention to what the Prophet ﷺ does, how he handles that moment. An assassin, an assassin. Someone trying to kill him in the house of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ deals with him so graciously, so benevolently, with such magnanimity, that won the heart of this young man. And that's something we're going to have to learn, and something we must remember. That when we deal with people, our mission and our cause is not to defeat the bodies. Our mission and cause is not to subjugate the minds. Our mission and cause has always been, is and will always be to win the hearts. To connect and join the hearts. فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَةِ إِخْوَانًا that's how enemies become friends. That's how enemies become brothers and sisters. And along that same theme, there's another very powerful story. Umayyat ibn Khalaf, who was a very staunch, very vile enemy of the Prophet ﷺ. He used to slander the Prophet ﷺ, attack the Prophet ﷺ, curse the Prophet ﷺ. Because he had dedicated his life, his existence, to opposing the Prophet 
He died, he met his fate in the battle of Badr and died a miserable death. That was his fate. His son, whose name was Safwan, Safwan ibn Umayyah, him, Ikrima, the son of Abu Jahl, we talked about last time, this was that next wave of leadership. These were the sons, the heir apparents. And so he was amongst them. And he had also just like taken up his father's mantle, like Ikrima had after Abu Jahl, of fighting against the Muslims and fighting against Medina and opposing the Prophet ﷺ. And when the Prophet ﷺ came to Mecca, Ibn Ishaq mentions this, Urwa narrates this, that Safwan ibn Umayyah, he fled. Safwan was also amongst the people a year earlier when according to the treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims had come to perform Umrah for three days in Mecca. That Safwan was amongst those people who had gone outside of Mecca to protest the presence of the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca. That if he's in Mecca, I can't be there. And they only came back into Mecca after the Prophet ﷺ had departed. Safwan was that staunch. So when the Prophet ﷺ was coming to Mecca and they found out, okay, it's all over, it's done, we lost. Safwan fled Mecca. And he basically fled in the direction of Yemen. He went to the port to basically board a ship on its way to Yemen. Umair bin Wahab, another one of the Meccans, he said, Ya Nabi Allah, he came to the Prophet ﷺ, he had accepted Islam. He said, O Prophet of God, Inna Safwan ibn Umayyah Sayyidu Qawmihi. Listen, Ya Rasulullah, very humbly, Safwan bin Umayyah, I know that he has his track record, he has his history. But he is a leader of his people. His family, his tribe, they follow him, they adore him, they, they listen to him. And obviously what he's alluding to is the fact that we want Makkah to be stable. We want to win the people over. And winning over their leadership will help us win them over. So he says, He has ran from you, he has run from you, and he's gonna go throw himself into the ocean. Now whether he was going to actually just kill himself, drown himself or not, or this, it's very likely this is like an expression as well, that he said he's just gonna go and set out sail into the ocean, go wherever the current carries him, but he's not gonna stay here. So it's like an expression. Basically he said he ran from here, and he's gonna board a ship and end up wherever he ends up, but he's not staying here. فَأَمِّنْهُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ O Messenger of God, please grant him amnesty. Grant him amnesty. Give him protection. Give your word that he will not be harmed. He will be safe. He is forgiven. Please, Ya Rasulullah. I beg you, I plead you. Sallallahu alayka. May God send his peace and blessings be upon you. Like we, we, this is what we have learned from you and come to expect of you. The Prophet ﷺ said, Huwa aminun. He is safe. He's safe. He said, Ya Rasulullah. He said that, you know, some people are gonna have a hard time believing it. He might even have a hard time believing it, that you just forgave him just like that. Because it's just so otherworldly. When have you ever known a human being that just does that? Oh, that guy who waged war against us and killed my companions and attacked my people and my city and my home and my family? Okay, forgive him. Like, where do you see that? It's remarkable. So he says, فَأَعْطِنِي آيَةً يَعْرِفُ بِهَا أَمَانَكَ He says, Ya Rasulullah, please give me some type of an indicator, some type of a token, some type of a, uh, of a symbol that demonstrates the fact that you have in fact given him your protection. Like something that must have come from you. And if I'm carrying it, and it has come from you, it's a personal item, then he's gonna have to take my word for it, believe it. And this was part of the custom and the tradition at that time. That that's how you would prove your truthfulness as a messenger. فَأَعْطَاهُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ سَمْ عَمَامَتَهُ The Prophet ﷺ literally took off the turban from his head, عِمَامَتَهُ أَلَّتِي دَخَلَ فِيهَا مَكَّةَ أَلَّتِي دَخَلَ فِيهَا مَكَّةَ The turban the Prophet ﷺ was wearing when he entered the city of Mecca. We talked about this previously. He literally took it off of his head and he gave it to him and he said, here, take this. This will prove it. 
فخرج بها عمير حتى أدركه وهو يريد أن يركب في البحر. عمير take this takes this turban of the Prophet and he goes to the port and he finds Safwan there about to board a ship. He says, Ya Safwan, screaming at him, running towards him. He doesn't want him to board the ship. He's about to board the ship. He says, Ya Safwan, Ya Safwan. He sees Umayr, and he knows Umayr has accepted Islam. So he's not really interested in stopping for him. He says, Fidaka abi wa ummi. Like which is an expression literally translates means, I would, I would sacrifice my father and mother for you. But it's a way to again show honesty and genuineness, like you care about somebody. He's like, please, 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 stop. Allah, Allah, fi nafsika an tuhlikaha. He says, by Allah, by Allah, save your soul, do not destroy yourself. I have a way for you. هَذَا أَمَانٌ مِّن رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَقَدْ جِئْتُكَ بِهِ I have brought the protection from the Prophet ﷺ. I have brought the protection from the Prophet ﷺ to you. قَالَ وَيْلَكَ He turns around and he says, You must be crazy, get out of here. أُعْزُبْ عَنِّي فَلَا تُكَلِّمْنِي He says, get away from me, don't talk to me. He does, you know, it's hard to fathom for him, hard to process for him. He says, أَيْ صَفْوَانْ فِدَاكَ أَبِي وَأُمِّي he says, Oh Safwan, please, please listen to me. He says, Abdalun Nasi, wa abarun nasi, wa ahlamun nasi, wa khairun nasi. Because he realized so hard for someone to fathom that the man that I've dedicated my life to destroying just forgave me just like that. Because you asked. That's all it took. He says he is the best of people, the most pious of people the most forbearing, patient of people, the most gracious of people, and the best of people. Ibn Ammika, he is like a cousin to you. You're related. Izzuhu Izzuka, he will grant you, his honor is your honor. Like he will honor you. Sharafuhu Sharafuka, his nobility is your nobility, he has accepted you, he's willing to embrace you. Mulkuhu Mulkuka, his Kingdom will be your kingdom. Like he's wanting to welcome you back. So Safan stops. And he says, Listen, honestly, brother, inni akhafuhu ala nafsi. I'm afraid he's going to kill me. He should. That's what I would do. That's what I would do to someone like me. Someone who had done the things that I've done. He said, Umair says to him, "Who ahlamu min dalika wa akram. He says, brother, you underestimate him. He's a lot more gracious than that. And much, much more noble and dignified than that. فَرَجَعَ مَعَهُ حَتَّى وَقَفَ عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. So he takes him back until they reach the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. فَقَالَ Safwan. When Safwan reaches there, he says, إِنَّ هَذَا يَزْعُمُ أَنَّ قَدْ قَدْ أَمَّنْتَنِي He still doesn't fully believe. He says that, O oh Muhammad, this guy, this friend of mine, he thinks, he tells me, that you have forgiven me, you've granted me safety, protection. The Prophet ﷺ sadaq. The Prophet ﷺ says, he speaks the truth. So he says, look at this, Wait, now, now, how do you expect this story to turn out? He says, Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah wa No, 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 no. He says, فَجَعَلْنِي بِالْخِيَارِ فِيهِ شَهْرَيْنِ Give me two months to think about it. You ever heard the expression, beggars can't be choosers? Right? You, are you in a position to negotiate? Do you have any type of leverage here? You wanted to come back home. And he's like, give me two months to think about things. The Prophet ﷺ says, "Anta bil khiyari ashud." Take four months, but think about it. Ajeeb. It's astounding. That level of, and there, you know, that level of the obvious, the la, that level of forgiveness and forbearance and kindness and graciousness, just such grace, such gracefulness and graciousness, and mercy. But there's another thing also, the look at the confidence of the Prophet Two months? Take four months to think about it. We all know how this turns out. 
We all know how this story plays out. And that's that thing, having that confidence, that confident faith, coupled with this beautiful gracefulness and mercy and generosity and forgiveness and benevolence. And when you combine those two things together, it's something really remarkable and really special. And that combination is what we call the sunnah of the Prophet That's the prophetic precedent. That's the example of Rasulullah That's the uswa hasana, the ultimate role model that the Prophet was. And the last thing I'll mention here is, Ibn Kathir mentions, there was a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Az-Zibara. Abdullah ibn Az-Zibara al-Sahmi. He was also one of the most staunchest opponents against Islam. And he had actually been like a very vocal advocate against Islam. And one of the things about him was, he was a poet. He was a very famous, talented poet. And he had pretty much dedicated the past few years to slandering the Prophet ﷺ in his poetry, attacking, verbally assaulting and attacking the Muslims in Islam in his poetry. And he came to Mecca at this particular time. He had fled, he was from Mecca, he had fled to Najran. And when he heard about the grace, the graciousness of the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet ﷺ is forgiving people left and right, he came back to Mecca. And he presented himself before the Prophet ﷺ, and he asked for forgiveness. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you are forgiven. ثُمَّ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ بِالتَّوْبَةِ وَالْإِنَابَةِ وَالرُّجُوعِ إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ وَالْقِيَامِ بِنُصْرِهِ وَالذَّبِّ عَنْهُ And he not only came back, but he asked for forgiveness. He repented, and he turned to Islam, he turned to Allah, he became Muslim, and in fact, he became someone who would then speak on behalf of Islam. And he used to write poetry on, in praise of the Prophet ﷺ, in praise of the Qur'an, in praise of Islam. And this was another very staunch, vile enemy, whose heart was turned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the means was the, great, the graciousness and the mercy and the benevolence of the Prophet ﷺ. I had intended to talk about uh, some of the missions of Khalid bin Walid because in the aftermath of the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ sent Khalid bin Walid on a couple of specific missions and there were some really important things that happened on those missions. But inshallah, we'll go ahead and conclude here. And inshallah, we'll talk about that in the next session. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallah bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.